It's your friends, it's Dr. Dickinson. So in this video series, I'm gonna be walking you through CalTPA Cycle 2 version 5.0, okay? So this is gonna be a really big deep dive into all of the documents, all of the steps that you need to do so you can pass CalTPA and get your teaching credential. Now, before we get started, I just wanna remind you guys that you're already doing hard things. You've, you've gone through your credential program, you know, you're working with students, you're um, planning instruction, you know, you're managing conflict. You've got this, okay? This is just one more thing. And I'm gonna show you step-by-step step how you can be successful and how you can plan and design instruction using all of the key elements of the CalTP so that you can be successful. Wanna also give you a huge shout out. Thanks so much for everyone that's been leaving comments and letting me know that you've passed. I had one student, she went up 15 points. So proud of all of you for, for doing this and putting in the hard work and not giving up. Because remember friends, it's not over when you lose, it's over when you quit. And I've got your back, so don't be afraid to leave a comment, a question, and reach out. We got this together. All right, teacher friends, we're gonna go ahead and get started with unpacking CalTPA cycle two. And this is specifically for version 5.0. I'm Dr. D, if you haven't known that, and you can also reach out and find me at Teacher Prep Tech. If you haven't already hit like and subscribe to my channel, why don't you go ahead and do that? Show me some love. And don't forget, you can also leave a comment in this video. Let me know what questions you have and how I can best support you. So let's go ahead and get started. We're gonna take a deep dive into cycle two. Now, if you've already completed cycle one, then you're probably familiar with this map here. Some of the big ideas from cycle one are also part of cycle two. You're planning, you're teaching and assessing, you're reflecting and applying, and then you're gonna plan and teach again. It's a cycle and you'll do it more than once. That's why cycle two is really the big enchilada. There's a lot to chew on here, friends. So don't feel overwhelmed. You can always hit pause, take some notes, come back and watch this video again. And again, leave me a question. I'm gonna get started by just going over some of the big ideas of what you're gonna be doing. In step one, you're gonna be writing a lesson sequence that is three to five lessons and includes content and language development, student use of technology, and informal, formal, and student self-assessment. Now friends, if you're a single subject teacher, you're gonna focus in on your content specific area. If you're multiple subject, if you've already done math for cycle one, then you're gonna do ELA for cycle two and vice versa. The big thing here is that you need to plan a lesson sequence. It's not a one and done. So my recommendation is to go ahead, take a look at your content standards for your content specific area. And you wanna always get started by unpacking your content standard. So the way that Common Core was designed is that you have concepts and skills that you're explicitly teaching. Same for NGSS, your Next Generation Science Standards. Everything in NGSS, as, as well as your VAPA standards and your PE, it's all performance-based. So there has to be a sequence leading up to what you want your students to do, and that's your formal assessment. So start with a very small idea and then build up to it, build up to allowing your students to move towards mastery, okay? And we'll take a look into that lesson plan template that's provided for you in this cycle too. So you don't get a choice here about um, doing your own lesson plan like you did in cycle one. So again, big idea, step one is the lesson sequence. Step two, just like your cycle one, you are gonna record yourself teaching. But notice here that the focus is different. In step two, you're recording four video clips that are very specific about what you need to focus on. The first video clip is the academic language. So think about teaching a lesson on saying, comparing, con contrasting two characters in a story. You wanna explicitly teach 
the academic language of comparing, contrasting, and all of the elements of that academic language that students would need to know in order to be successful at the activity. And video clip number two, you are going to be showing student use of technology. Now, this is the one video clip that you don't actually have to be in. You are going to be showing students using technology. So for example, you're a math teacher and students are working on a Desmos activity because they can't do Desmos off the computer and it allows them to use digital math tools, which are pretty awesome. You would videotape yourself engaging and using technology. They also want to see not just students using it in a silo, but actually having conversations and doing that deep thinking that happens. Now, I've seen a lot of teachers also use technology like a Flipgrid or Seesaw um, or doing Google Slides, you know, as a team to do a presentation on a topic. There's many different ways, and I actually have another video just specifically on this video clip. So definitely check that out. Video clip number three is informal assessment. So they want to see you and the students here and how you are informally assessing them and engaging them in higher order thinking. Now, um, again, all of the video clips are only five minutes. So you want to get the meatiest part of where you're assessing, where you're having these awesome conversations, you're asking these really great questions. That's the clip you want to show. And then clip number four is student self-assessment. And this video clip, they want to see how students are engaging in self-assessment and how you're using that data to make informed instructions and sharing that data with your kiddos. So much different in terms of what you're going to be recording and what the CalTPA Cycle 2 is looking for. Step three. Okay. After you've done your videos, they want you to analyze your formal assessment data. So again, going back to my example, your students are comparing and contrasting characters from a story. You're going to make a rubric. Maybe they're writing a paragraph or they're writing a character analysis um, based on their uh, ability to compare and contrast. You will have a rubric in which you will formally assess their ability to do that. Now, a big piece here is making sure that your rubric, your scoring criteria is aligned with your content standard and only your content standard. Sometimes teachers throw in other things into the mix and then the, the uh, evaluator is like, hmm, I thought they were doing comparing and contrasting, but why are inferences here? And why are they also assessing them on making claims from the text? Okay, so be specific and be aligned, okay? And yes, we can even assess our littles. Um, this formal assessment data is a rubric that you're going to use to determine your student's progress. So make sure that um, it's something that you will use to score, and then you'll be able to see where are, which, what percent of each group of your students are at different levels of proficiency towards that standard. All right, now that we talked about step three, the next step, friends, is step four. And I'm sorry to tell you that in this step, you will analyze your data, all those pieces of data, and then you will plan, teach, and re-record. You heard me. You will record again, okay? So I just did this wonderful lesson, comparing, contrasting. Now I videotaped myself and I of me, of myself teaching this lesson. I'm analyzing this data. And now I'm going to decide, am I going to either reteach, which would then imply that, hey, based on this data, 40% of my students have not developed proficiency of this skill. I'm going to reteach it. I'm going to take this skill of comparing contrast it and apply it to another story, another context, so I can move them towards mastery. Or what what 95% of my students have this skill. Okay, they are able to add and subtract with integers. And now we are going to do an extension activity, we just did adding and subtracting. Now we're going to extend that and they're going to move into another concept and skill like multiplying and dividing. Okay. And you have a choice here, friends. You can say, 
This reteach is just a small group of kiddos. Only, you know, 10% of the class who didn't get it. So I'm just going to do a small group. Or the reteach is a, a majority of my students. I'm going to use whole class. I want to see the rationale of how you're using data to make informed decisions. That's what step four is all about. So let's take a deep dive into step one. Step one begins with template A. If you haven't already checked out all the templates that are provided for you, Definitely do that, pull it up, press pause, and let's go through this together. In template A plan, you are gonna provide contextual information. And friends, what that really means is they wanna know who your students are. They wanna know who you're teaching and what do these kiddos bring into the classroom that you can use or you can leverage to do that planning sequence, to go into that part B which is um, your three to five lesson sequence. So the big ideas here is your profile of the entire class. And take note, there are no focus students in cycle two. What are their prior academic knowledge? Now for this, you really wanna say like, what do they know about this concept and skill that I'm teaching? Have they done comparing and contrasting in other grade levels? Yes, but maybe it was just on fairy tales or yes, and maybe it was just for fictional and I'm doing informational text, okay? So they wanna see you connecting those dots. One of my favorite tools for math teachers is um, Achieve the Core, where they literally unpack all of your content standards and you can see the progression across the grade span. Another great tool is Renaissance Learning. They do that for ELA and they do a wonderful job so you can see the progression of learning. Because hey, let's face it, you may be a fourth grade teacher and you've never taught third grade, so you don't know what they're doing. And if you don't know, then um, just tap on to all those other teachers at your school site and ask them, what do they do in this standard in your classroom? Um, how does this standard progress into fourth grade and things like that? They also wanna know about your, the English proficiency of your students and the cultural and linguistic resources and funds of knowledge that they bring into the classroom. Okay, so let's just take a look at template A together and walk through this. Okay. So first things first is you are going to only have a limit of four pages here to write about your class. You get started by talking about their student assets and learning needs. Remember, we will always wanna use asset-based language and we wanna talk about what are the wonderful things that our kiddos are bringing into the classroom. Again, starting with the prior academic knowledge related to the learning goal. So you really can't get into this too much until you've decided what you're gonna teach. So start with the standard and then unpack that standard, thinking about prior knowledge and skills that they should have acquired in other grades. You also wanna talk about your English language proficiency levels. So if you have ELLs, you wanna share here, maybe they've taken the LPAC, where are they in their language proficiency? It's always great to, to you know, just provide some data here to let them know that, hey, I've looked at my students' LPAC scores. I know what their level of proficiency are. I can tell you what percent of my students are English language learners, what percent are reclassified, and what percent of my students are English only, okay? Then we're gonna talk about the students' cultural and linguistic resources. I know that's a mouthful, say it together, cultural and linguistic resources. So here we really need to know our kiddos. We need to know, um, what do they do on the weekends? What, you know, uh, what is their family structures like? Um, you know, what, where are they going? Um, are they going camping? Do they, you know, are, are we a beach community? Um, a way the community that we have a large agriculture or farming town. Here are you gonna talk about it through an asset-based lens. You also wanna talk about funds of knowledge, right? So some of their prior experiences, their interest, things that connect with what the students are interested in, like they like to play Roblox or you know the funds of knowledge being that, you know, my students are bilingual or maybe my students are come from multicultural homes and things like that. So we want to bridge that into our um, and 
into our work here and sharing and highlighting all of those assets and wonderful things about our kiddos. And then part D, we wanna talk about our prior experiences and interests. Now it is in bold here, related to the content you plan to teach. So this requires you once again to think about your content standard and how you can hook your kiddos based on what they're interested in. So if I'm doing, you know, um, comparing, contrasting, I might talk about my students have prior experiences, comparing, contrasting, you know, their favorite food or their favorite sports and um, how I can make that bridge related to the content. Finally, we wanna talk about their experiences using educational technology as well as assistive technology. Now for your TK kiddos, this could be limited here, right? Because more likely than not, they weren't in the classroom during the pandemic. They aren't on Google Classroom and things like that. But you can always talk about some of the things from their home. Students have experiences using iPads, you know, um, they like to play Roblox at home, things like that. So any experiences using educational technology, and of course, for our secondary teachers, typically there's a lot here. Stud students, you might want to talk about if you have a, an LMS, a learning management system, if the students are on Google Classroom, um, if they, you know, were students during the pandemic and some of the experiences they've had with learning remotely and things like that, you can certainly bring into this response here. All right, so once we've flushed out this first part, description of student assets and learning needs, then we're just gonna provide some contextual information for the class. Really, it's very, this is just, you're just responding to these questions here. So you don't have to go into a huge deep dive here in terms of, um, you know, your in-person or your online synchronous environment, just say which one it is. Uh, and of course, again, talking about what ed tech or appropriate assistive technologies are available and to be used in the learning segment. So again, part A, part of this can't be done until I've already planned out what I'm going to be doing. And once I have, then I can go back and say, hey, we're gonna be using a flip grid here and I've also planned on having my students do a digital thinking map using Poplet, which by the way is a wonderful tool, or maybe they're gonna record themselves on Seesaw um, and things like that. And then again, you're just gonna share some raw data here about who are your kiddos and um, how many of each do you have in each of these categories. All right, so that is pretty much part a in a nutshell and hopefully you're feeling a little bit more comfortable with this first piece channel i love hearing from all of you and hearing some of your positive messages about how much my videos have helped you pass cal tpa so definitely keep reaching out keep connecting this is one of the best professions and it is worth it don't forget your kids love you so keep fighting You'll get through this and I'm here to support you. So feel free to reach out at any time and I'll see you in the next video where we talk about our three to five lesson sequence.